Thank you. Um, can everyone see the screen fine? Okay. Uh, it's the first time here. Uh, what's the makeup of the group? Are we programmers trying to be programmers? Um, mix, mix both. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Uh, no, awesome. Um, well, I'm Chase Pritchett. I'm the manager of software development at Surgical Care Affiliates. And I'll be giving a talk about single page apps. Um, pretty easy going, so just raise your hand if you have any questions. We can uh, jump into stuff a little deeper if we want. Uh, for this part, this will probably be kind of a philosophical one. Why are we even uh, moving to single page apps? Um, so one thing I really like to talk about is the why, the for, what, in any case. And uh, really with a single page app or spa, you get just so much better user experience. And you're really starting to close in on native apps. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of advantages over native apps. Like it's easier to deploy. I'm just putting it on my web server. I don't have to go through an app store. I don't have to work with the IT department to get it published out to or desktops. Um, it's cross-platform by default. So we've got Macs in our enterprise, and I don't have to worry about can they use this app, can they not use this app. Um, dev tools on Firefox and Chrome are amazing, so these things are easy to debug as well. And then we're starting to get a lot of support for offline modes with like service workers. Um, so the web has just been iterating and iterating and getting better and better and closer to native. The, uh, these apps are really awesome now. Wikipedia has a pretty good definition of what a spa is, and it just says a single page app is a web app or website that interacts with the user by dynamically rewrite, rewriting the current page rather than loading the entire page from a server. Um, so if that doesn't make too much sense, I wanted to just uh, go through a simplified history of the web. And if we kind of go back to the beginning of the web, everything was static, HTML files, uh, links, if I clicked on a new link, I got a whole new web page sent back. Um, and that really wasn't very scalable. Um, it's nice, but it's not very scalable. If you think of something like Stack Overflow or Wikipedia, um, you wouldn't want to have a static web page for every single um, article or question ever asked. So we started to get uh, this concept of a dynamic generated web page. And you probably know PHP or ASP or JSP for Java. Um, and just kind of an example of that. Um, if I go to Stack Overflow and type single page application, if you watch this um, refresh bar on the top, one indicator that this is not a single page app. Come on, this lines I'm not on there. Connected. One second. Okay. Hopefully this is the technical glitch of the, the talk. Oh, well. Uh, no big reason to look at that. Um, but basically, on a uh, non-spa, you'll actually see the, the refresh bar up at the top kind of blink, and the page will flash. And that's, um, I'm sure everyone's maybe been on like a, a site that was a little too big, and you type in a contact form, and you hit enter, and like two minutes later, it finally submits. I mean, that's it's kind of annoying. So. Uh, one nice thing that kind of came out of all this was the concept of AJAX, or asynchronous JavaScript and HTML. Um, and that allowed for partially going out and getting data. So we didn't have to go back and reload the entire page. I could say, um, just give me some update to a page, get that data back, and re-render that section. 
And kind of the main um, JavaScript object for this is the XML HTTP request object. And if you're using a small framework like Angular or React, you're probably never actually gonna work with this object. I uh, just want be, you to be aware of that. Um, it's probably an abstraction over it. Um, but kind of what this did, if you look at that orange section, um, part of the page is able to submit a request to a web server and get something back and only update that, that part of the code. Um, and then does anyone know about the browser wars that started happening in like 2005 or six? Uh, so Internet Explorer was like the dominant player and the web was, was not uh, moving at all or improving. Um, but we had things like Firefox and Chrome and Opera um, really start to push the limits of performance and what we could do, uh, which ultimately made everything better. And we started seeing frameworks like jQuery, um, Backbone, Knockout, really unify JavaScript development and make JavaScript a first class language. Um, and it's really gotten us to where we are today. Um, so maybe the kind of differentiating part of a SPA versus Ajax is you've got lots of different parts of your web page now uh, that's able to talk to a server, able to get reloads and refreshes and repaints, and it's not reloading the entire page. Um, so yeah, if we just jump back to that definition, any questions so far? Anything I'd like to go deeper in, just from on a, a what it is? All right, let's move on then. So, how do I get started? Um, you know, go look at your familiar examples, Gmail, Slack, Trello. Um, you don't have to look at the code necessarily, but look at all the interactions. See how the page is not reloading. Open up your dev tools, look at what kind of network requests are being sent. Um, look at how the DOM is being manipulated because it's, it's really fascinating stuff. And you may not even realize some of these apps were spas, but they are. Um, and the good news is we have a ton of frameworks now or libraries that are awesome. And the bad news is we have a ton of frameworks and libraries that are awesome. So you've got your choice. Um, you'll hear these uh, clickbait articles that are like React versus Angular or Showdown or Vue is the best. And the really, reality is they're all kind of the best. Um, so pick whatever's best for you, whatever mm -hmm. makes sense. Because um, they've all got different, um, different flavors and ways they do things differently. And you're really not going to go wrong with any of the choices. Um, so when you're trying to decide on what to even look into, one thing I'd suggest is what language do you like? Do you like TypeScript? Do you like JavaScript? Um, Elm or other functional languages? Because um, that's going to play a, a key role in do you like this, this language or this framework. Um, personally, I love TypeScript. Um, style guides. Uh, look for what the community has built what are they saying are best practices? What is good? What, is, um, what does good really look like? Because that'll help drive how fast you learn. Um, and then does the framework support components? So over the past two years or so, component-driven development has really um, kind of become the de facto standard on all these frameworks. And then understand how the routing of a, a spa works. So one of the most annoying things on a spa is if you're doing all this work and then you hit the back button and all of a sudden you're back at like Google. Um, when you use a routing framework, um, it's going to push into your, your URL state changes. So when you hit backwards, it's going to go back to what you were previously working on, not the previous website you were on. And then, um, so when we put all the app code on the browser, we have to manage that state. So how do you wanna, how do you wanna manage that? What does this community really use? In React, there's Flux architectures and Redux. 
Um, Angular has similar versions of that. Um, and one example to think of, so an app we've worked on at my job, um, it has like 12 tabs, and it's all similar to kind of Excel functionality, but there's different validations occurring between the tabs. Um, so how do we get all these things to sync together, talk to each other? Um, that's just a really important thing to think about. And then what kind of architecture patterns is the community promoting? Um, is it immutable data? Is it um, model view, view model stuff? Um, there's just a whole bunch of stuff that you might like one community does and you might not like what the other one does and that's fine. Um, but just make an educated guess on what you like when you go into it. And then next is view templating. Um, React is maybe the most uh, opinionated on this. It has a, um, its own language called JSX that it translates into HTML views. Um, some people really like it. Other people think it's not the right separation of concerns. Uh, I personally think it's pretty neat. Um, but if you look at like an Angular, you're actually building HTML views for each component. So it's slightly different ways of thinking about these. Um, and then next is testing. So we're building more complex apps. You're going to break stuff as you keep developing. So build a safety net. Make sure you're not introducing regression errors. And if the framework has a really good um, story for how to do the testing, that's just gonna make it easier to get up to speed. And then uh, another interesting thing is just CSS encapsulation. Um, so if you don't know, if I put a CSS style on a web page, um, it's global for everything. Meaning if I say my hyperlinks are green, then all hyperlinks are green unless I make something a little more specific with a more specific class or ID. Um, but tools like Angular, what you do is if you build a component, you can do styles in that component that only apply to that component, um, which is really powerful and keeps you from getting a lot of spaghetti uh, CSS code. And then lastly, one of the biggest uh, things that's been coming up recently is uh, command line interfaces for these tools. Um, so Angular, React, Ember, I know they all have it. Uh, Vue has one as well. But what that lets you do is there's all this plumbing, especially in Angular, for adding a component. You know, you have to go add it to the module. You have to set up certain providers. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world. But what this does is takes away all the pain of that. So you can add that. It will handle bundling for you. So if you don't want to learn Webpack, because uh, it's another beast, um, it will produce bundles for you. And you can even set it up to do uh, lazy loading bundles if you want smaller, uh, smaller chunks of code coming to the, to the browser. Um, definitely check those out, because those are really great tools. Um, so yeah, kind of going back just to the arguments for SPAs. Um, I think, I think we are really getting close to being better than native apps uh, for a lot of reasons. And things like WebAssembly are on the horizon. I think it's going to make it even, uh, even more noticeable that the web is uh, the best way to go in a lot of cases. And you, know, you may not want to do a spa for stuff. Uh, you know, we looked at Stack Overflow and Wikipedia, and those don't make probably great candidates for spas because um, you know you're you're adding a lot of complexity to the front end when you do this um, historically spas have not been search in engine friendly um, Google has been making changes that it'll, where it will actually start to read JavaScript and there's some techniques called isomorphic JavaScript where you can um, get your page to render and then angular or react will boot up and take over that will help with search engine friendliness. But you know, if you've got your business homepage, you probably don't want that to be a spa, honestly. Um, you are going to see a little bit of a slower page load because you know, you're taking down this whole application, you're compiling it, putting it into memory, and bootstrapping it. Um, that's just going to be slower than 
just loading raw HTML. And then if you have metrics on what kind of devices your customers are using, if they're using maybe like an older Android phone or older iPhone, um, the performance just isn't gonna be that smooth on those devices. Um, and another big one that kind of gets forgotten, um, if I just go to a web page and I get a 404, you know, Firefox or Chrome immediately just says 404 not found. Um, or if I have authentication errors, it'll prompt me at that point. Um, when we're doing this all asynchronously with Ajax, um, we as developers have to catch those and bring it up to the user's attention. Otherwise, they're gonna click a button and not notice anything actually happen because um, it's just gonna error in the background. So you really need to think about your error handling story as well. Um, yeah, so I wanted to list a few free resources um, that I like. Um, Tour of Heroes walkthrough on angular.io. Uh, it's really good for, if you wanna learn just the, the hour long story of getting up and running on Angular, it's great. And then if you're a little more interested in React, Kent C. Dodds has a course on egghead.io that is um, that's free and it's like 70 minutes or so. Uh, but it's really good about just getting into React. And then, make sure I got internet. I really wanna show this next tool. It's called StackBlitz. be a bummer if I can't get up this web page. This is a really cool web page. It lets you develop Angular and React and Ionic stuff in the browser and it does uh, uh, reloads uh, in real time for you. I think it's, I think it's coming up. Um, but on this tool, they've essentially taken Visual Studio Cloud or Visual Studio and pushed it up in your browser. Uh, it's just, it's a really amazing tool. Well, well I'll see if that comes up. Um, yeah, any questions about this? I have the Tour of Heroes app pulled up on my local dev box if we actually want to look at some code. I uh, wasn't sure how technical uh, we wanted some of this stuff to be. Yeah. 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 So yeah, any questions, things you'd like to look at? Uh, we, at my job, we picked Angular just because we were on the Angular 1 uh, train back in 2011, and it, uh, it just felt like a natural thing to go to Angular. Uh, I guess five now is what they're on. I'm sure it was on a faster Yeah, uh, yes, if it's faster, it's a night and day, day difference. Yeah, so he asked if I could give examples of things we're building. Um, so one thing I'm building is, um, so at, so we did, we're in the surgical care business, um, so surgery centers essentially. And for, you can almost think of each surgery center as like a franchise in a lot of ways. Um, so at the end of every month, they have to submit financial data for what kind of cases they saw, how much money was generated, what are they expecting, um, accounts receivable. Um, and then accountants have to then take that data, make sure it's all valid, do some workflow back and forth. And they were in Excel and we, we moved them up into um, 
Angular, they're on Angular 4 now. And, um, you know, we built in a lot of really nice user features like arrow keys, like Excel, like you expect. Um, we're able to do some functionalities similar to what you'd expect in Excel. Really trying to minimize the learning curve from going. It's this process they've used for like 17 years. It's terrible. Uh, but trying to get into something a little more centralized. And we were, we originally started on Angular 1. And unfortunately, we have to support uh, Internet Explorer. And um, we actually like hit the limit of what we could get Internet Explorer to do. And just changing to Angular 2 with really out, with really not much code changes, um, uh, like it just changed the performance night and day. It was really amazing. Um, so that's kind of a big one. Um, other ones we're doing stuff in Azure. Um, so we've got um, WebSockets essentially that are sending data down to clients connected as they're working throughout the day to see um, you know, what kind of cases are re me ready, for, ready for me to bill, that kind of stuff. Yeah, they essentially get like a um, journal ledger lines for an accounting book, and they go validate those, and then it's kind of the first pass to does it actually go on our journals and accounting statements. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of other issues, just how do we store Excel documents and who has access and all these things by going to the web. We were able to centralize and... Make a lot easier. Um, so we're all in Active Directory, so we can tell, like, when you go to this web page, who are you? What facility are you? Do you have access to this facility? Do you not have access to this other facility? How do we keep all this data um, segregated so you only see what you're supposed to see, essentially? Um, and then before that, everything was just kind of on SharePoint. They would upload files and maybe remember if to actually upload them. Accountability was kind of hard when it wasn't centrally visible. Did that answer yeah. that question? Yeah. Yeah, so he asked if I've looked into PWAs or progressive web apps. Um, I started looking into service workers quite a bit. Um, so those are pretty neat because it's essentially a background thread that can be running. Um, so if you think of your phone, you might get notifications from Facebook throughout the day. Um, this would essentially allow you to make a background thread that can run if the browser is open or closed. Um, and it allows for a lot of offline <laughs> functionality, which is pretty neat. So if you start trying to do your data calls through these service workers instead and uh, say your internet just goes down like mine has, apparently. Um, stuff will still work as, mu as much as you programmed for it to work. Um, so those are pretty neat. Um, I'm still waiting for Apple to say they're, they're going to do PWAs on the iPhone before, I'm, uh, before I believe they'll, they'll stay around and actually be a thing. But Android has uh, pretty good support for them. Anything else? <laughs> sure, let's uh, let's chat after or whatever if you want. Okay, this thing is really cool. Um, so if I don't want to learn how to get Angular or React working on my machine, you just go to Stack Blitz, I click Angular, 
And I've got Visual Studio Code and my bundled app next to me. Everyone could go to this link as we're changing it and making changes and actually see what's going on. Um, if you see here, I'll just, uh, I'll just type hello world and it'll pop up on my view over on the side. You can create, um, you can create files. There's a, you can rename. I think there's an easy way to actually create components on here, but I have to look at it. Um, but yeah, if you just want to try this stuff out and don't want to take three hours getting your dev box running, this tool is awesome. And you can even download your project when you're done. Type npm install and then npm start and you're up and running with it on your own box. Um, so it's really neat. Definitely check it out. He mentioned uh, the Cloud9 browser, uh, maybe not being too friendly with NPM packages. Um, I honestly haven't looked at it too much. Um, but yeah, we're even looking at using this tool for like interviewing and uh, just because it's so easy, easy to build something out and share. <laughs> Yeah, anything else? Sorry about the uh, the internet thing. Oh, that's all I've got. <laughs>